Welcome to Talking Foreign Policy. I'm your host, Michael Scharf, Interim Dean of Case Western Reserve University School of Law. In today's broadcast, we'll be discussing President Obama's controversial executive action on immigration reform. Our expert panel today includes Austin Fragaman, head of the largest immigration law firm in the world, who is joining us from New York City. Here at the WCPN studios in Cleveland, we have David Leopold, former president of the American Immigration Lawyers Association, Margaret Wong, a local immigration law expert and author of the book Immigrants Way, and Jenna Payton, a Case Western Reserve University School of Law professor and Cleveland immigration lawyer, who volunteered last summer in Artesia, New Mexico, to provide legal assistance to the thousands of mothers and children who fled to the United States from Central America. Thank you all for joining me today. Thank you, Michael. Let's begin our discussion with Jenna Payton. Jenna, tell us what your experience in New Mexico was like last summer. Thank you for uh, inviting me here today. Um, when preparing for today, I couldn't quite figure out how to make my 10 days in Artesia into a little snippet for the radio. It was by far the hardest thing I've ever been a part of in my professional career. Um, Artesia is in the middle of nowhere, and it was a facility where President Obama decided to place um, away from any nonprofit legal providers, uh, essentially barracks for mothers and children who were fleeing violence and other problems in Central America. Um, because it was so far from free, any free legal service providers, uh, about, I don't know how many hundreds of immigration attorneys came and donated hours to uh, to provide legal services for the mothers and children. The average age of the child there is six years old. And the only ones held there are mothers with children. Uh, we were able to successfully place the majority of those cases. We were able to actually, Artesia was shut down and some of the cases were transferred to other facilities in Texas. but. It was an extremely challenging and difficult experience. Yeah, I wanted to start with you because immigration law sounds like such a wonky topic. And yes. I wanted to remind everybody out there that this is about real people, real lives, right. often little kids that really are, are suffering under the circumstances. So can you provide some background that will help us understand the big picture? Uh, first of all, just before the broadcast, you told me that we shouldn't use the term undocumented or that we should use the term undocumented yes. aliens rather than illegal immigrants, which is yes. what I was going to be using. Why is that terminology so important? What's wrong with the I word? Well, I think it encapsulates down to no human being is illegal, right? That's the message we're trying to convey, that these people are the same as you or me. They don't happen to have the documentation that you or I enjoy because we were just happen to have been born here. Uh, it's a derogatory term. It refers to a criminal action and not doesn't show deference and respect to these women that honestly many of the people that are entering our country now are fleeing they are seeking the protections that have been provided to citizens and non-citizens in this country for centuries and upon which foundation this country was founded okay so we'll use the word undocumented aliens thank you michael <laughs> how many of them are living in the united states right now i think i did look this up and it looks like around uh, we're leveling out around 11.2 or 11.3 million um, not, it's, it is shocking how many of those are long term, meaning over 10 years or over 20 years. About 62% of those have been here more than a decade. About 21% have been more than two decades. The majority have U.S. citizen children. So we're talking about families. We're talking about neighbors. All right. So 11 million, that's like 4% of the population. It's a, it's a large number of people. Yes. Where are they from? Which countries? The majority are from Mexico. Other countries that are represented are um, El Salvador, Guatemala, India, um, Honduras, China, Philippines. I mean, really any country in the world, all continents. Um, I think that the majority is around 59%, and that's around 7 million from Mexico, like I just said. So what were their steps to citizenship before the executive action that was just taken by the president? To become a citizen, one must first be a permanent resident. And to obtain permanent residency, which is the, permanent residency, the same thing as a green card, same thing as an immigrant visa, um, to obtain that, one must have a family sponsor, essentially, or a, a, a employment sponsor. Another way to obtain permanent residency would be through what's called the diversity visa, which is known as the lottery. So your chances of winning that are about as good as winning the lottery. Uh, there also are investment visas. 
a handful of ways through the courts to gain um, permanent residency, such as applications for asylum or other um, litigating in the courts or the agencies. Okay. So in the meantime, before they are permanent residents and get U.S. citizenship, what are their rights and obligations? So do they pay income tax? Uh, are, do they get driver's license? Do the kids get to attend public schools? Uh, do the college students get to get in-state tuition? Um, it depends on the state by state in terms of the kids uh, and their educational abilities. Of course, the U.S. citizens are always entitled to uh, any educational benefit. Um, for the children that are um, undocumented, uh, some states do provide in-state tuition. Unfortunately, Ohio is not one of those progressive states. California, Florida, and I want to say about a total of 18, I think, uh, do provide in-state tuition for um, undocumented students. In terms of taxes, um, if they are if they don't have a social security number, that many undocumented are able to essentially uh, provide uh, registration of their taxes by obtaining what's called an individual taxpayer identification number, and through that they can record their income that has been earned and therefore pay taxes on that. And the majority of the undocumented want to pay taxes. Can, can I jump in there? Please an do. Point. This is David Leopold. Yes, thank Go you. On, David. And Jenna, I just wanted to. to to supplement what you said, because you referred to the ITN number, the International Tax yes. ID number. So how do you think we know that there are 11 million point two, uh, whatever? They're paying taxes, and yeah. we know that through the International Tax ID numbers. That's how we get those figures. All right, so one of the biggest insights I've had this today already is Your that second. <laughs> yeah, these undocumented aliens are paying taxes. Yes. It's not, in fact, the case that we're just carrying them on our backs and or that they're all unemployed. A lot of them are employed, right? They are employed. They're part of our workforce. And again, like I said, they want to pay taxes. They want to contribute. They want to register their presence. They want to give back. And trust me, if they had the opportunity for a driver, for a uh, work authorization, which would give them a driver's yeah. license, all they want to do is be productive, and they want to be able to drive and otherwise contribute to our society. David? Well, yeah, and, and I agree with Jenna. You know, the paying taxes part also, uh, there are many studies that show they're keeping the Social Security system afloat. And interestingly, they're paying into the Social Security system, but they're not going to get the benefit. Okay. So there's a pot of money sitting there. Right. So with all this, I'm going to tell you something else that is quite surprising. That is that a lot of the supporters of immigration reform have been dubbing President Obama, before his new executive actions, the deporter-in-chief. Mm -hmm. And that's because he's been deporting in his administration. How many, Jenna, would you say? I think the last numbers for fiscal year 2013 are 438,000. And, and, and this is more than any other president He actually, year. in total. Yeah, in his fifth in year total, in term, yes. he had already surpassed uh, George W. Bush eight years. And the irony, the absolute irony of that is that he, by deporting 400,000 people a year, he is showing that he's following the dictates of the law to the letter. The law requires the president to set enforcement priorities. We'll get into this, I'm sure, a little later. But um, the Congress has only given the president enough resources to deport 400 plus thousand a year. So he's using the money as it was intended. Uh, and he's earned himself, uh, from many of his supporters, uh, the moniker deporter in chief. Of course, at, at that rate, it would probably take 30 years to get through all 11 million. But let's go to New York City, where we have Austin Fragman standing by. Austin has been a leader in the immigration field for four decades, ever since graduating from Case Western Reserve Law School. <laughs> Yay, Mr. And Fragman. Austin has testified before Congress on immigration reform. And Austin, let me ask you if you can tell us what you consider to be the most urgently needed reforms in our country's immigration laws. Well, the um, most urgent need is to regularize the 11 million um, undocumented aliens. And um, that's um, particularly important because they really don't have a path to regularizing their status since there is a bar um, to changing status or becoming a, a resident through lawful means once you've been in the United States um, out of status for, um, uh, for, for a year. In fact, there's a 10-year bar. So legalization is really the most important. And whether it's a path to citizenship, meaning that 
um, that one could automatically become a permanent resident after fulfilling whatever the requirements are, such as in the uh, Senate bill that was um, uh, was passed last year, um, or uh, whether it's um, just allowing persons that are here without status to have a waiver of that particular provision I just alluded to that basically states that they're barred from changing their status or normalizing their status. So that's really the, um, the most important. Another very important um, uh, provision would be to allow graduates of U.S. universities, particularly those with um, advanced degrees, to remain in the United States and to facilitate that um, through um, some, some mechanism as opposed to our current system where graduates of um, U.S. universities can have PhDs or advanced degrees and are frequently um, finally forced to leave the country because of the uh, shortage of H-1B visas for, for them to switch to, which leads to the H-1B visa and the other categories that have um, numerical restrictions. Um, we, we, we just need more numbers, so both Austin, for H-1s and for, for visas. Austin, you mentioned that the Senate passed reform legislation last year, but that wasn't enacted into law, was it? What, what is holding back Congress from being <laughs> able to enact real legislative reform? Ah, How the same thing that's uh, holding it back from doing anything. <laughs> But right, we'll call it congressional gridlock. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> okay, but the, the Senate, it was, was it the Democrats that wanted the reform and the Republicans that blocked it, or are, is this a bipartisan um, issue? No, it was more complicated. It was a bipartisan issue. The bill was um, actually written by um, Senator Schumer and Senator Rubio, so you had a Republican and a Democrat. In fact, um, one of the partners of our firm um, had uh, resigned from the firm, and um, was the uh, lead person for Senator Rubio, and he's certainly a, a conservative Republican. Um, and they came to agreement, and the bill passed um, 68 to 32. Um, the House refused to consider the Senate bill, but rather um, decided that they would um, consider each of the issue areas covered by the Senate bill separately. So that was a very laborious process. They basically um, made their way through uh, four different um, separate bills, which were reported by the House Judiciary Committee but never got to the House floor. Of course, now with the new Congress starting, um, the House and the Senate have to start, uh, start all over right. again. But it seems that the big problem was with the uh, more conservative members of the Republican Party who uh, uh, who made this di process quite difficult. Okay, so we're coming to the time for our first short break. I think we've got a really good scene setter. People understand what the issues are. When we return, our experts are going to tell us about the executive action and critique it. And we'll see what the pros and cons are of the way moving forward. So stay with us. Welcome back to Talking Foreign Policy, brought to you by Case Western Reserve University and WCPN 90.3 Ideastream. I'm your host, Michael Scharf, Interim Dean of Case Western Reserve Law School, and we're talking today about President Obama's controversial executive actions on immigration reform. Our expert panel includes Austin Fragaman, founder of the largest immigration law firm in the world, Cleveland immigration lawyers Margaret Wong and Jenna Payton, who both teach at Case Western Reserve University School of Law, and David Leopold, past president and general counsel of the National Association of Immigration Lawyers. I'd like to start the segment with David. So, David, I understand that when the president announced his executive action, you were there at the Roosevelt Room that day. Can you tell us how you ended up being there that day and, and what that was like for you? Well, how I ended up being there, as anyone's guess, I mean, I have been privileged to work uh, with, with a lot of people in Washington on, on some of these ideas and some of this legislation. And uh, I ended up being there because uh, I got an invitation the night before, please be in the Roosevelt Room with the president tomorrow. And you don't you know, get an invitation like that, you show up. So, I, but what I will tell you is that he did have his, he was there, he had his senior aides there, um, and you could feel the gravity in the room. Uh, what was going on in that room was historic. Uh, the idea that the president was going to take executive action, which would essentially bring five million people, five million people out of the shadows, and temporarily, of course, um, but 
nevertheless, and uh, that he was going to he was going to do some things that were hopefully um, going to move business immigration forward. We're going to use some ideas that that uh, investment ideas using the law in a way that a creative way to make sure that entrepreneurs have a place in this country and are able to stay and build business and create jobs for U.S. workers. So it was a really momentous occasion. And, you know, you look around the room and you see all these portraits and you see the president standing there, sitting there, and you kind of pinch yourself. But it was, I was just very, felt very privileged to be part of that. Now, you told me right before the broadcast not to use the word executive order because that's what the press is calling it, but that's not actually right. Why do they have it wrong? What is it really that's going on here? What's going on here, and my colleagues will will understand this, you know, because you said at the beginning it's very wonky, immigration. I think you said that, um, and it is. I mean, really what happens in immigration is we live by guidance, by interpretation of the agency. And really what's going on technically, legally, is the, uh, the president through the secretary has issued a variety of memoranda and in these memoranda is where he's set forth the various programs for, for temporary reprieve for parents of U.S. citizens, uh, expansion of the program we call uh, DACA, the Dreamers um, Temporary Reprieve, and various memoranda which are targeted to hopefully liberalize or bring into the 21st century some of the visa programs that we have so that we can, we, as Austin pointed out, we need to keep students in this country. So they've expanded uh, hopefully, they're going to be expanding the practical training programs. They're going to be using um, the national waivers so that people uh, can be credited because of the money that they're going to invest. And this is all written out in memoranda, uh, guidance to the agency. So there's no order in place. Uh, presumably, a President Ted Cruz, excuse me, but it could happen, <laughs> President Ted Cruz on the first day of office uh, could direct his new Homeland Security Secretary to rescind every one of those. Um, and so it, it, it's not even in order. All right. So, Margaret Wong, you've also been to the White House three times in the last couple of months, met with the president. To you, what is the most important aspect of this immigration executive action? Um, the first time I was meeting with the president was when the uh, the uh, Prime Minister of India, um, Modi, came to America. So he had 20,000 people in New York, and he was there. And the second night, he came to the White House for the state dinner. So a group of Indian leaders and Asian leaders, we get to meet together, I was lucky, and I pinched myself, just like David was saying. It's like, my gosh, you know, being a foreign-born, being an immigrant, I got to sit, like, virtually two feet from the president. Um, and he gave us, like, a whole one and a half hours talking about Asian um, importance, talking about, of course, there's politics, but it still is very nice. And I noticed the Indian people are very good with their pushing of their agenda. They want the Indian... Uh, U.S. attorney one day. They want a U.S. Uh, Surgeon General, which is happening. They want, you know, this and this and this. On the other hand, the Chinese, we are a lot more, oh, you know, everything is okay. So it's it's a different culture mentality. But the other two times uh, in the White House is more for parties. And it's amazing. He must read the guest list before he come in because I was amazed that he remembered me. Um, he said, oh, I promise you that I will... Uh, issue executive order on that, executive action on that. And I did it. I did it. So it was very nice. And he remembered, but I think I'm sure and, he And what part of the this. executive action to you is, is the most important? I think it's interesting because I personally didn't think he went far enough, and I told him that. He did not include DACA parents because these are the DACA kids. Okay, so DACA is D O C D A C A. D A C A. And that's the Dreamers. For what? The They're dreamers. the dreamers. So, and it's the whole well, conversation. Dreamers are also initials for D R E A. It stands actually That's for um, deferred act. It, it stands for defer, um, deferred action for, deferred child action action for childhood arrivals. Right. I told you immigration law was wonky. But oh, anyway, so those cases. Let's fun. try not to use the initials. Right, yeah. right. So the parents of these children, and I went to some of these children's meetings. It's really fun. They make the the kids, the teenagers, get up in front of two or three hundred people, and then the teenagers say, just like admitting I'm an alcoholic, because it used to be very, it still is. We don't talk about our immigrant roots. We don't talk about how I got my green card. 
it's like a shame that oh I'm a foreigner you know I you know I have whatever I had a rape I had an abortion these are all shameful, shameful issues so when the dream children came in they say I am undocumented I have no papers my parents bring me here when I was young I want to stay in America I want to so it's making them get up and admit it until we admit that we have no papers we cannot fight for our mm. our work papers so they did that and that was like in June 15th of 1 2 then 6018 no um, 6018 came in in May of 1 3 so through the years President Obama have made it easier so 601A stands for what? We'll go back to David. A, to a, a Margaret, Margaret is very wonky and very intelligent. <laughs> yeah. Let me break it down to simple because I think simply. Austin referred to a 10-year bar, and, and, and he correctly pointed out that when people have been in the country without documents uh, for more than a year, if they leave the United States, they're, they're facing a 10-year bar to return. And what Margaret was referring to uh, when she says 601, the president tweaked the, uh, tweaked the regulations a couple of years ago to allow people to apply for uh, the removal of that ban before they travel abroad. So there is a way to remove that ban if you can show hardship to your spouse, your U.S. citizen or spouse or, or, or your parent. But in the old days before Obama, you'd have to go overseas and wait so we had people sitting in, for example, in some very dangerous places, Suarez, Mexico, at the height of the, of the, of the Cartels. cartel yeah. wars. People were getting killed. And so they tweaked the law just a bit, not the law, the regulation, just a bit, to allow people to apply for the, the waiver, we call it. From the U.S. Yes, from the U.S. And so what he did on the 20th of November when he announced an executive action was he expanded that just a bit to include people who are lawful permanent residents. In other words, a spouse of a lawful permanent resident who may be undocumented can apply for that dispensation, that waiver before he or she travels. And, and Margaret, you're saying that's one of the most important provisions to you. Yes. Okay, Jenna, what would you say was the most important provision to you? I think the most important provision to me and to my clientele would be the parents of the U.S. citizen, which is referred to as DAPA, a D-A-P-A, just for another wonky set of initials for mm -hmm. you. Um, and those are situations where you, ha you can have a long-term resident here. They have U.S. citizen children. They're able to show, more likely than not, some type of good moral character, maybe by paying of taxes. Uh, it's a simple registration process, right? All you have to show is identity, that you've been here, and then you would qualify for reprieve. And you also would qualify, more importantly, more tangibly, uh, employment authorization, which provides the Social Security and the driver's license and everything else. So, Austin, we didn't forget about you in New York <laughs> City. Um, to you, what were the most important provisions of the executive action from November? Well, I mean, certainly the ones that were mentioned affect the most people. So <clears throat> we would have to um, argue they're the most important. However, I will point out that um, uh, that um, for all practical purposes, persons who would qualify for DAPA, the Deferred Action for Parental Accountability, um, were had a fairly low um, probability of ever being apprehended and, and or asked to remove uh, uh, asked to be removed from the country. So. Um, I think um, maybe some of the uh, employment provisions have been um, overlooked, and the, particularly the section that talks about um, um, uh, updating and revolutionizing the um, the uh, visa system. And um, interestingly, the president there directed the um, major players in the process, the Secretary of DHS and the Secretary of State and whatnot, Secretary of Labor. Um, to do detailed analysis of the various um, processes and um, pra uh, areas that were under their control. And I, I think that we're, we're going to see a lot come from that that's going to be um, very interesting and very helpful. Let me ask you about some of the other provisions that haven't been much in the news that you were telling me about before the show. So first of all, how will the executive action affect foreign students who want to remain in the United States for practical training after the completion of their education? Well, the, um, the, the one of the sections of the um, executive, we'll call it the executive order, um, uh, what, what, or executive action is really, I think, probably the best way to put it, 
um, directs the um, uh, the head of uh, USCIS to, um, which is the um, U.S. Um, you know citizenship <clears throat> and uh, immigration service, and and essentially what it does is it directs the um, the head of that agency to take a look at the foreign student process and and to come up with a way to allow. Um, an extension of the practical training of foreign students. And this allows students to work either during the summer or after they graduate. Um, and it's time limited. And so the idea is to both expand the number of fields of study for which um, practical training is available, um, while at the same time to extend the total period of practical training. And the reason this is so important is that um, the next step in the process for foreign students to remain in the U.S. is to apply for an H-1B visa. And because the demand so far exceeds the uh, supply, um, about 50 percent of the persons who applied last year were selected, um, there's a great advantage to being able to apply more than once. And by extending this period, it gives uh, the foreign students a chance to um, apply uh, several times. And in addition, it might give the foreign student an opportunity to actually file for permanent residence. Um, so this is a, a very important provision. David, did you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I, I think it's also smart public policy because we've trained these kids here. And so why should we give them the degree and then put them on the airplane and send them home? And I think extending practical training and, and the particular focus on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, makes a lot of sense, and to broaden it makes a lot of sense, um, and uh, it's just very good public policy. And so, if I may, yeah, go ahead, Margaret. Yes, if I may, Michael, I just thought it's interesting for the audience because probably you're just listening to a podcast, you're just listening to a Case Western show, but being having lived in this town forever, I thought it's important for our listeners to know who we are. Listen carefully what David says, what Austin says, what our interim dean of Case Western, because we all somehow are graduates or professors there. So when I see our dean, I'm like, my gosh, I need you to prove this. I need you to do this, you know, so because we are just professors. He is the dean, he's our boss. On the other hand, listen to what Jenna says. Jenna teaches both CSU and Case um, practicum. What does that mean? That means she, and she speaks pure Spanish. That helps her going to Artesia. So listen to what David, David is national because she, he was the president of National AILA. Austin runs the world's, Austin makes a lot of money, a lot of money. <laughs> Don't let his quiet, he's a serious comp competitor because I am one of his competitors. So lis listen to all of us and watch and listen, because I don't want you to waste an hour. Later you said, oh, I didn't learn anything. But watch the personalities, watch the competition. Austin clearly is competing with David. One say executive order, one say not. And I'm, I'm listening to this and I'm, saying, I'm too old for this. See, I think Austin, Austin, yeah, older I think than Austin I am. may have won that battle. Though. That's right. No, 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 it's okay. <laughs> so I really want our people to listen, because when I saw our uh, interim dean, uh, Professor Schreff talk, inviting us, and none of us declined. I'm like, eh, maybe I should decline, you know? And I'm so competitive. I say, I'm just going to sit on the table, even though I'm a foreign born, I'm the only foreign born in this. I'm going to face David Leopold, Jenna, because I think they're all better than I am. But on the other hand, you know, we are all very vain as practicing lawyers. And um, but Austin, you are awesome. So is David. So is Jenna. So I have to. We think you're great too, Margaret. Oh, thank you. But we have seriously. <laughs> all right. So let me cut through the love right. fest. Yes. <laughs> One of the things that you all are saying is that this is actually really good for the economy. And yes. I want to go back to Dave to uh, Austin because President Obama had said that one of his major concerns was promoting research and development. And I want to know, Austin, if you think the executive order or action, as we should be calling it, enables more foreign inventors and entrepreneurs to enter the country? Well, if, if, act, if what he um, uh, outlined um, actually comes to pass, I would say it'll make a fairly significant difference. It's very difficult um, for someone starting up a company um, as an entrepreneur or um, an investor um, to uh, qualify under our current visa system. Um, and so this, this could really be helpful um, because for the first time, inventors, researchers, and founders of startup businesses would be able to um, enter the country or to remain here. 
and that would include, um, we, we see this often with um, uh, graduates of um, science programs in the U.S., STEM graduates like engineering programs and things of that sort, um, or computer science, um, who are uh, have some brilliant idea and want to start up a business, and it's very difficult for them to acquire a visa. So this um, would allow them to stay here until they uh, really had the qualifications to apply uh, through one of the other categories. Um, and then there's another category um, which, um, which, which he's directed be expanded, and that's one for um, uh, national, what, they call, what we call national interest waivers. So somebody who's um, doing something that's strongly in the national interest um, would be allowed to uh, remain in the United States, and um, the, his uh, the directive here deals spe specifically with um, inventors, researchers, and founders of startups. Um, so uh, I think this should, um, you know, uh, be be very very um, useful uh, in that community and and allow a number of people to um, remain in the U.S. Jenna, can you quantify the aggregate economic impact that has been reported of these reforms? Exact numbers? No. <laughs> but what we're looking at is, I think that millions of dollars easily in terms of how individuals will, will be able to invest not only in houses, but also in retirement accounts. Uh, again, just the idea of someone having a driver's license, being able to purchase a car, purchase automobile insurance on the smaller level, and then work their way up. And this could also benefit many of these blighted cities that we have, which is another whole topic of discussion. But some of the uh, areas of certain cl cities, including Cleveland, uh, have been struck with a foreclosure crisis, and houses are going for few dollars and those who have the ability and documentation would then be able to afford those and help supplement the economy there. And all the investors coming in, they'll create more jobs, they'll uh, create more software, that we buy more softwares, they'll have more things to sell in Costco that we can so go buy. with all these great economic impacts, you would think the American public would embrace this. Wouldn't you? But the Gallup organization has done some polling and it turns out that the American people disapprove of the executive orders by 51 to 41 percent. They're wrong. When we come back, let's look at what the downsides of executive action on immigration reform is, and let's explore why there is a court case that is working its way through the courts and what the impact of that might be. So everybody stay with us. This is Michael Scharf, and we're back with Talking Foreign Policy. I'm joined today by four of the country's leading experts on immigration reform. I want to go to David Leopold first, who has had the position um, in the past as counsel and president of the American uh, Association of Immigration Lawyers. And I want to ask you, we were just talking before the break about the fact that Despite the positive economic impact of the executive action on immigration reform, the American people aren't that fond of it. And certainly the Republicans in Congress are against it. So what have their policy criticisms been about this reform action? Yeah, well, first of all, the American people um, are strongly in favor of immigration reform. Uh, I think the numbers, every poll that's come out has shown 60, 70 percent in favor of fixing this immigration system. But they want Congress to do it, right? That's yes, the problem. Yes, they do want Congress to do it. Yeah. But in terms of the criticism that has been pointed at the immigration actions, really what's gone on is the claim uh, by the critics is that the president has, has, has gone outside of Congress and created law on his own. Uh, that he has violated, technically, he's violated the, the faithful execution clause or the take care clause of the United States Constitution, which requires him to faithfully execute the law, meaning that if he gives a deportation reprieve, then he's not executing the law. The legal argument really in favor of, immigra of these immigration actions is not all that complicated. I mentioned the take care clause. Well, the president has the requ is required by the Constitution to take care that the law is faithfully executed. The law, the Homeland Security Act, says that the president must decide, set enforcement priorities, meaning he's got to decide who to deport first. Is he going to go after the, 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 the hardworking mother who's changing linens in Toledo? Or is he going to go after the drug dealer? who doesn't have citizenship? Is he going to go after the, 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 the guy that's, that's picking uh, lettuce? Or is he going to go after 
somebody who uh, has an affiliation with ISIS. Uh, and when you couple that, that's an enforcement prior. And I think we all so, know. But are you really saying that before this executive action, he was going, the people that were under him enforcing immigration law were going after the lettuce pickers and the the housewives? Absolutely. Well, well, there were enforcement priorities in place. He's required by law to set those priorities. And we had what were called the Morton memos. Um, so on paper, yes, they were going after the bad guys. In reality, at least until the last couple of years, they were going after what we call the low-hanging fruit. It's easier and safer to arrest the mother who is changing linens in Toledo than it is to go after the hardened criminal. But um, th So the president has been setting these enforcement priorities and has been uh, spending the money that Congress has given him to deport everybody. So he, he, they only give him enough money, enough, enough resources to deport 400,000 people a year. He's been following that. That leads to deporter-in-chief, right? So he's actually been following the law. Now, the, the executive actions, DAPA, the, the Deferred Action for Parental Accountability, the one that, that expands to the, to the parents of U.S. citizens, the claim is that that's not legal because that is a categorical grant of deferred action. The problem with that argument is that it's not, it's, first of all, it's not correct. It's not a categorical grant. Everybody gets an individualized assessment. But the, the problem with that, real problem with that, and the disingenuousness of it comes from the fact that every president, back to Eisenhower, has used deferred action. They didn't necessarily call it that. But starting with Eisenhower, through Kennedy, through all of them, they've used this. George H.W. George H. Bush uh, used something called the Family Fairness Program. Uh, back during the legalization uh, that came after Ronald Reagan. And uh, that was very similar to what they're doing now. Uh, I don't recall the Republicans screaming and yelling at that point. So a okay. lot of this is political. But it is political, and they are screaming and yelling. And let me ask Austin about the most recent legislative developments. On January 14th, the House voted to reverse the president's action. Austin, do you think that a similar bill may pass the Senate? And would Congress have the votes to sustain a presidential veto? Can, can they force him in other ways, for example, by passing immigration legislation as part of a bill that the president needs, such as funding for Homeland Security or the Department of Defense? Does Congress have the cards to play to reverse the president's action? Austin? No, in fact, I would, um, I would suggest that, um, that the Republicans are off on a very dangerous excursion from a political standpoint, and we can come back to that a little bit later. But right now, is, as you know, DHS funding expires on February 27th, 2015, which was part of an agreement reached last year where they basically advanced the appropriations for the other um, federal uh, agencies, but um, but not DHS, um, to give them a chance to take up the uh, e executive um, action. Um, I do. Um, I don't think that the uh, Senate will pass a um, a similar bill um, because essentially, um, for the president, uh, I should say, for the Senate to pass this bill, they're going to need 60 votes, um, and they only have 54. And I see this being a straight partisan issue. Um, but even if it did pass, the president would veto the bill anyway, and there wouldn't be enough votes to uh, override his veto. So this is going to lead undoubtedly to a budget showdown over DHS funding, which in fact will be a proxy battle over the executive order. Right now, the administration's turning up the heat on the Republicans publicly, warning that a prolonged fight would jeopardize national security. Um, interestingly, defunding HS, DHS um, would affect key DHS functions such as border security and anti-terrorism, um, but it actually wouldn't affect uh, the provisions we've been talking about, um, like DAPA and DACA, um, because essentially they're funded through user fees um, and therefore um, don't need a separate appropriation. Um, so. Um, I think we'll, um, we're, we're going to see um, uh, quite a uh, robust debate, um, would be my best guess, um, going forward here. 
And I don't know, um, you know, right now I couldn't exactly foresee how this impasse will be resolved. Well, if, if they're um, not succeeding in the Congress, they could then turn to the courts. And let me ask David this. I understand that 26 states now, including Ohio, have joined together in a court case, Texas versus United States, challenging the constitutionality of the president's action. Where does that case currently stand? That case is pending decision in front of a federal district judge in, in, in Texas. This would be Judge Andrew Hennon? Yes, Judge Hennon. Uh, and um, Judge Hennon has drawn a lot of criticism because he issued a, he issued a, um, a decision in which he, he was very critical of some of the practices of uh, Customs and Border Protection. Uh, but, you know, I've got some hope that, um, that, judge, that judge Hennon uh, will actually uh, dismiss this case on standing. I'm probably the only one, only immigration lawyer, only advocate who's saying that. But, you know, if you so read... So let's take a second and explain standing yeah. to those who aren't lawyers out in the listening audience. Well, yeah. I, sorry about that. You, in, in order to sue, you have to show some harm. If, if, somebody, if, if somebody breaks a contract with you, Michael, I can't sue because I'm not you. I wasn't harmed. So... Standing in this context means they have to show, these states have to show that they have been directly harmed by what the president has done. Uh, it's very. Well, what's their argument that they have? Their argument that they have is that the president has failure to enforce the loss, as they put it, um, will cause an illegal migration. And they point to the, the children that came in over the summer, uh, the folks that, um, that Jenna was good enough to go help in Artesia, people like that. Uh, the problem with that is that it's it, it 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 it's just there's no nexus between the two, no way to show that. Uh, number one, you know, and I'll tell you a true story. I was driving back from Columbus when they filed this lawsuit. I've been speaking down there to the Hispanic group, and um, a reporter from the Chronicle, Houston Chronicle, called me up and said, "Do you mind reading this complaint and giving me a comment?" So I pulled over the side of the road, you know, and I thought, "Okay, I'll read this thing. And it's going to take me a while." I was done reading it in about five minutes. And I take it that's not typical of a court case <laughs> on immigration law? No, it's like Very a 30-page complaint. It didn't yeah. take long because it didn't take me long to figure out that that complaint really was a press release masquerading as a, as a poorly a factually challenged legal document. But I mean, David, it, I think the reason why it was so... I shouldn't say poorly. Who am I to judge them? You know, they are the attorney generals of the state. And I wrote, actually, Mike DeWine a letter complaining that Ohio should never join in. Those are border states. Those are southern states. We are north, north, you know, eastern. So, um, but I think the reason why it was not that well crafted or drafted, they did it in a hurry. They announced it, and then they filed it in like five hours. So well, they couldn't have done a good job. Well, th you may be right, Margaret. Mm -hmm. um, my, my theory is that they, they don't have any law and they don't have any facts, and that's why they did such a poor job. I think this case, whether it's Judge Hannon or whether it's the Fifth Circuit, the Court of Appeals, where it would go uh, if there were, uh, I suppose, under either type of ruling, uh, or the Supreme Court, if necessary, will throw this case out. I'm pretty, com pretty confident, having read the complaint, having looked at these issues, having written about this, um, I would be um, very, very surprised if this, if this case uh, stands. Well, let me go back to Austin and ask you in New York this question. If the court rules against the president, what are the consequences? Let's say David's wrong and they don't throw the case out and they actually rule on the merits against the president. What do you think would happen? Well, I, I think the, um, the greatest consequence of um, ruling against the president would there be, a, you know, there'd be a great swell of um, political opinion um, supporting um, what he did and, and uh, an outcry for um, some sort of... Um, legislative relief. Um, I think that would be a very likely consequence. I think that there's actually a greater chance of um, having immigration legislation, notwithstanding um, uh, all the, um, the gridlock, um, with both a Republican Senate and a House. And um, I think the uh, more enlightened leadership of the um, you know, of, of the uh, Republican Party does want to move ahead a, a limited immigration bill. Um, certainly not something as, um, as broad, perhaps, as um, uh, what would be contained in the um, executive order. Um, so 
Um, I, it, it, I think things would just move on, but I don't know that it would really make um, that big a difference um, other than the political fallout and, of course, the m massive disappointment you'd have in the um, alien community by those who might have been granted um, deferred action. But don't forget, this was not solving the immigration problem. This is just allowing people to stay here and not have to worry about um, being uh, removed from the country. This doesn't make anybody a permanent resident or um, it's, a, you know, it's not a pathway to anything. Um, so um, that's, that that would be uh, my thought on that. David, you wanted to chime back in on this? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest fallout from all of this, if it doesn't change soon, is going to be to the Republican Party. I think that they're facing a 2016 presidential election. And recently, we, uh, we watched uh, the hearings, at least I did, uh, part of them, the hearings for Loretta Lynch, the uh, attorney general, uh, uh, nominated attorney general. Uh, and there was all kinds of talk over the last several months that this was going to be this was going to be a proxy fight for immigration, and they were going to tear her apart on immigration and where, where she stood on the president's action. And you know, probably a lot of this was because she handled herself with such grace and with such poise, and she's brilliant. But she had she she pretty much took the Republican questions, particularly Jeff Sessions, senator from Alabama and chairman of the committee, and people like Ted Cruz no friends of immigration, ardent restrictionists in the Senate, anti-immigrant restrictionists. And metaphorically, she chewed up their questions and, and spit them out. She, she carried the day. And I think what this tells us is these, number one, they don't have the facts. They don't have the law. Um, and they don't have the politics on their side. Um, the, we, the, the biggest gro voting block in this country is the Latino vote. And yes, they did, they, 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 the Democrats got hammered in the last election in 2014. But things, the electoral map is much different for 2016. And we, you know, ask Mitt Romney, what happens when you turn your back on the Latino vote, Mr. 23% of the Latino vote? One of the things I find interesting about how this litigation is playing out is that you do have a majority of the states now, 26, in favor of overturning the president's action in the courts. But you have 30 major cities that have filed their own amicus briefs or together, and they represent probably a greater part of the population. And they're in many of the same states as the governors mm -hmm. who have uh, filed this complaint. Margaret, tell us, what do you think is the significance of these amicus briefs? And, and also explain what amicus means. Okay, for amicus our audience. means that they, the part, another person signed a brief, uh, wrote a brief, assigned a brief that uh, maybe other people have written and filed it with the court in support or in opposition of the action. So it's literally friend of the court brief. That's right. right. That's right. And what do you think is the significance of these amicus briefs? I really think what happened is like a herd mentality when all the attorney generals decided to sue against the cigarette makers. Suddenly, one follow after another, they can make some money. So now they made some money. The ones who didn't follow didn't make it. And there's really no loss. Like if Mr. DeWine refused to join, then if Texas win, he'll sort of feel left out because he's Republican and our governor is Republican. So for now, though, I really think it doesn't mean that much because all these states, they join together for all sorts of stuff. On the other hand, though, New York, California, Chicago, they're all giving people driver's license with or without papers, and they make money from it. And Kasich himself has said that in the New York Times last Sunday, mentioned that when people throw you money, I don't understand why the states don't take it on the Medicaid, Medicare issues. Same with all these issues. The government is going to give us money to do certain things. Why don't Ohio take it? It's not like we're that rich that we can afford not to accept it. So David, from your point of view, you're optimistic the case isn't going to prevail. Let me ask each of the other three of you, are you as optimistic as David, or do you think there is a, a chance that the court could issue an injunction striking down the executive uh, action? Before the answer, I'm talking about ultimately prevail. I okay. don't know what this is. So you think at the district court? I think there's a good provision. chance that this judge will actually follow the law. And if he does follow the law, he'll boot it on standing. But before. maybe... I'm in probably okay. in the minority on that. But. Margaret, what do you think is going to happen at the end of the day in this court case? I think in the end of the day, the president will prevail. I agree. Jenna? I think as Aust well. Austin, 
How yeah, do you I, uh, I see the tea leaves at the Supreme Court on this? I mean, I think there will be um, there will be a case because even if um, this one gets thrown out, I think um, the Republican House would probably sue. I mean, Boehner's been talking about doing that already, and he'd have a much better standing argument. Um, I, I, you know, it's a very, very tough question. Um, the president actually w- w- it was very narrow in in. Um, the group that he selected here, and that's what Margaret was frustrated about, that it should have included more people. Austin, but I have to it is bring so the... narrow, might, he might um, prevail. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're out of time, and I think we could have gone well over because this is just getting interesting, but we're coming to the end of the broadcast, and one thing I think is clear is that this country is in the midst of a constitutional conflict over immigration reform, and our experts are telling us that the next few days and weeks in the legislative branch and in the judicial branch are going to be very interesting, so stay tuned. Austin Fragaman, David Leopold, Jenna Payton, and Margaret Wong, thank you all so much for being on the show today. I'm Michael Scharf. You've been listening to Talking Foreign Policy, produced by Case Western Reserve University and WCPN 90.3 Idea Stream. Talking Foreign Policy is a production of Case Western Reserve University and is produced in partnership with 90.3 FM WCPN Idea Stream. Questions and comments about the topics discussed on the show or to suggest future topics, go to talkingforeignpolicy at case.edu. That's talkingforeignpolicy, all one word, at case.edu. Thank you.